Well, good evening, brothers and sisters. We're back in Philippians tonight, and we are going to be looking at verses 2 through 11 of chapter 1. And last week, we introduced the theme of Philippians from chapter 1, verses 27 and 28. Let me reread those verses for us now. Paul writes, Only let your manner of life be worthy of the gospel of Christ, so that whether I come and see you or am absent, I may hear of you that you are standing firm in one spirit, with one mind, striving side by side for the faith of the gospel, and not frightened in anything by your opponents. And so here Paul tells us that the theme of this letter is, is about living a life worthy of the gospel, and that is going to involve being unified, it's going to involve a proper understanding of the gospel, and it's going to involve doing all of this in the midst of trials. And we read about the background of the church uh, last week as well. We read about that from Acts 16, and we noted that it's significant that Philippi is a Roman colony. And in this highly stratified, honor-based culture, we saw that in verse 1, Paul took the humble approach of introducing himself as a slave while going out of his way to honor the leaders of the church, the deacons and the overseers. And so that's the background. Let's pray and we'll dive into this week's study. Heavenly Father, we are so grateful for you. That you are Father, I thank you for some of these rich truths that are in these verses that we're about to see together. We're thankful for your word that you've given to us, that you have revealed yourself. And we pray, Father, that you would make us a people who live lives worthy of the gospel of Jesus Christ. That we would be unified, having the same mind and the same spirit, standing together side by side, firm in defense of the gospel. And Father, don't let us be frightened by anything. Lead us forward tonight. Continue to do the work that you are doing in us, that work that you're one day going to bring to completion. We ask it now in Jesus' name. Amen. So let me start off by just reading the text for tonight. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God in all remembrance of you, always in every prayer of mine for you all, making my prayer with joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. And I am sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. It is right for me to feel this way about you all, because I hold you in my heart. For you are all partakers with me of grace, both in my imprisonment and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel. For God is my witness how I yearn for you all with the, with the affection of Christ Jesus, and it is my prayer that your love may abound more and more with knowledge and all discernment, so that you may approve what is excellent and so be pure and blameless for the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. And so with the exception of verse 2, what we're seeing here is Paul's prayer. I've tried to give a little bit of structure for uh, this video and for our discussion tonight, help me keep on track, maybe help you as you think through it. And so we're dealing with his prayer uh, for the Philippians. And note that this prayer is filled with thanksgiving in verse 3. It is with joy in verse 4. Joy is going to be one of the significant themes of this letter. And it's clear that Paul has this special affection for the Philippians. And as we uh, continue on, we'll see why that is. And Paul prays specifically that they will grow in love. We see that in verse 9. This is going to be critical for your, their unity, that they have love and are growing in love. And this love must be rooted in knowledge and discernment. We'll see how important that is as we continue. Verses 10 and 11 also indicate that this will produce transformed lives. Paul is praying for their lives to be changed. Well, we go from praying to partaking. One of the ways that Paul and the Philippians are unified is that they are all partakers of God's grace. And this grace, we know from verse 2, it comes from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. And the ultimate goal of this grace, as we see in verse 11, is to bring God glory. And because of this grace, the Philippians, they stood with Paul. He says, both in my imprisonment and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel. So I want you to take special note here. Paul is suffering for the gospel, and he's noting here in his prayer, his prayers often introduce the themes of his letters. 
He's noting here in his prayer that the Philippians have stood with him. He is suffering. They have stood with him. Can you put two and two together? Can you tell where this is going? Later in this letter, he's going to talk about how they will suffer for the gospel. But it's so important that we recognize that the grace that God gives is sufficient for us to endure such suffering. Praying, partaking, and partnering. Paul highlights their partnership in the gospel. And he says, from the first day until now. What does he mean by that? Well, let's turn to chapter 4. Chapter 4, verses 15 and 16. Paul writes this. And you Philippians yourselves know that in the beginning of the gospel, when I left Macedonia, that's the region that Philippi was located in, when I left Macedonia, no church entered into partnership with me in giving and receiving, except you only. Even in Thessalonica, you sent me help for my needs once and again. They supported Paul financially. Even as new believers, they were so committed to the furtherance of the gospel that they supported Paul's ministry. What a joy this must have been for him. It was God who called him to this apostolic ministry. And Paul, we know that he was a tent maker, that he had means to support himself. But as anyone who's been in full-time ministry can tell you, uh, having that additional support, having that support so that we don't have to go out and work another job and can give our lives fully to the church, fully to the gospel, and gospel ministry is a wonderful blessing. So no wonder Paul had special affection for these people as he was dealing with churches that, uh, churches that would have, uh, in some cases, fought back against him, didn't receive his apostleship as well. The Philippians, right from the beginning, were supporting him, encouraging him, and, and, and that wasn't just in their prayers and in their affection, but with their finances as well. But they also partnered with Paul in uh, financially meeting the needs of other Christians. We read about this in 2 Corinthians 8. 2 Corinthians 8, verses 1 through 5. Paul writes, We want you to know, brothers, about the grace of God that has been given among the churches of Macedonia. So this includes the Philippians, as we noted. For in a severe test of affliction, their abundance of joy and their extreme poverty have overflowed in a wealth of generosity on their part. For they gave according to their means, as I can testify, and beyond their means of their own accord. They wanted to do this. They gave because they wanted to. They gave sacrificially. Verse 4, begging us earnestly for the favor of taking part in the relief of the saints. And this not as we expected, but they gave themselves first to the Lord and then by the will of God to us. Do you want to know what the root was behind all this? Why would the Philippians support the Apostle Paul in his ministry? Why would they support uh, this, this uh, offering that Paul was taking? I think that was for uh, the needy believers in Jerusalem. Well, they did it because they had first given themselves to God. They knew that all that they were and all that they had belonged to God. And so they could give generously. They could give sacrificially. Praying, partaking, partnering, finally persevering. Persevering, the Philippian church was not without its faults. And we'll see uh, some of those in the weeks ahead, but their partnership in the gospel up to this point already demonstrated that their lives had truly been transformed. And we know this, right? That we can be saved, that we uh, are living these lives uh, that, that are being transformed, but we still have moments of sin. They're not perfect yet. God hasn't completed his work in them yet. But Paul knows, Paul is confident that these are regenerated, justified, uh, Holy Spirit-filled believers. And Paul, throughout this letter, he reminds them about their salvation, that God is the one who initiated it. He is the one, we'll see this in chapter 2, I look forward to that, I love that part of chapter 2, that, that God is the one sanctifying them, and he is the one who will preserve them. Look at verse 6. And I am sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion on the day of Jesus Christ. How good is that? What an important reminder. I know I need that reminder. For, for me, this reminder, maybe you've heard me say this before. You'll probably hear me say it again at some point. Um, I have a picture that I've framed of this verse. And... I don't have it in my church office just yet. I think I have it in my home office. 
I keep this verse close, I keep it hanging up. It's in my mind, it's in my memory. Because when the tough days come, I need to be reminded that God, that God isn't going to give up on me. And he's not going to give up on you, brothers and sisters. He's going to complete what he has started. And, and it is what he started. He starts it, he finishes it. The author and the finisher of our faith is how the author of Hebrews refers to Jesus Christ. God's not going to leave us stranded somewhere along the way. He will finish what he started. So let's consider some application for this. Praying. When we pray for each other, brothers and sisters, we ought to be praying and giving thanks for each other. I don't know about you, but sometimes I can be quick to jumping, uh, to asking for things, asking for needs to be met. Paul regularly demonstrates how important it is that we ought to be giving thanks to God for each other and to do it with joy, to do it with joy. And if we can't do it with joy, that reveals something either about a lack of reconciliation, a relational issue, or, or something that's wrong in our hearts. We ought to be praying for each other to have love, and not just love, but a love that is rooted in knowledge and discernment. How important is that in, in this day and age? It's important in every time, but how important is that for us in a time where we, we are still living the church in the church growth movement's wake? It is going strong. We're uh, telling us that this is what it looks like to love. This is what it looks like to grow as a church, to partner together as a church. And it's really just all this imaginative, made-up stuff where Scripture in some ways has just been put to the side. Sure, we can have scripture for our doctrine, but when it comes to uh, what we do to grow as a church, well, that's where our imaginations and our creativity come into play. We ought to be cautious of that. We ought to be aware of that. There are those who uh, just completely ignore the word when it comes to defining love and uh, define it in this, uh, this humanistic sort of way. Uh, they define it in a cultural sort of way. There are those who ignore biblical knowledge and talk about personal revelation. Scripture isn't good enough. I, I need this new revelation. And that's how I'll tell you uh, how we can partner together and how we can serve the Lord together. We ought to be praying for love that is rooted in knowledge and spiritual growth. As we uh, are partaking of God's grace, it's good for us to remember that we have part, uh, partook, I guess that's the past tense of it, we have partook of God's grace, we have partaken of God's grace, and we continue to partake of that grace. And we must remember that his grace will be sufficient for us in times of trial and difficulty. He's given us everything that we need in Christ. And we hold on to that, we cling to that. Well, partnering, our partnering together, it might look a little different right now, but we ought to be looking for ways that we can advance the gospel. How can we be supporting each other right now? Paul found support from the Philippians even in this time of imprisonment. And <laughs> while well, we're in our own self-confinement, if you will, uh, it's not just self-confinement, the government's telling us to stay at home while we're in this time of, of confinement. How can we support each other? How can we encourage each other? We need to make sure we're looking out for those brothers and sisters who are in need. And finally, persevering. What a wonderful doctrine the perseverance of the saints is. And I'll probably put some notes in this email for you to look into if you want to dig into that more. But we will keep holding on because it's God who is holding on to us. We persevere because he preserves us. And all these things that we, we can do these things. We, we can pray. We, we can partner together. We can seek to advance the gospel. We can be unified because of what God is doing in us. We're not trying to do all these things to earn his favor, to get his grace. We're not. No, 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 no. We can do these things because we've already received grace. And we will persevere because he preserves us. Let us pray. Father, we pray that you will bless our time as we continue tonight in discussion and in prayer uh, for the needs of the church body. Lord, bless and continue to bless the teaching of your word. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.